Hi, it's The Wire. It is Wednesday, July 21st, 2021. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Digitalassetlife.com, a free site. A lot's been going on in the metaverse, right? In the cryptocurrency universe. There were a lot of concepts being thrown around. Uh, Lightning Network for Bitcoin, etc., Let's talk about some recent developments. Let's try to put this in perspective. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Remember, nothing I say in this video should be construed as financial advice. Rather, I want everyone watching this video to consult with their own financial advisors in reference to their own financial decisions. Okay, so I'm just giving you one man's opinion of what's going on in the world. Now, in the comment section of this YouTube video, in the description section, more accurately, I have a link to an article by Lynn Alden. Now, let me just say, Lynn Alden is outstanding in terms of discussing not just cryptocurrency, but also things happening on the financial landscape, right? In the world of finance and banking. She's excellent. Now, her piece concerns Ethereum. Let me point out that I've owned Ethereum for years. Let me point out, too, that I own proof of stake coins. I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, although I believe there's Bitcoin and then there's everything else, right? I'll speculate on some stocks. I'll speculate on some cryptocurrency. But I believe anyone who is in the Ethereum space, especially given this EIP 1559 upgrade, needs to understand the risk involved, right? Understand, in my opinion, Ethereum is far riskier than Bitcoin, far riskier, less secure than Bitcoin, right? So what I want people to do here is to take advantage of the link. I'm not getting paid for it. I don't know Lynn Alden. I'm just a fan of her work. But take advantage of the link Read the article. You're going to find out that in a world, the metaverse, that prizes decentralization, you'll find out that because 70% of the Ethereum nodes use Amazon's AWS, Amazon's web services arm, Ethereum might not be as decentralized as you think it is. Right. Let me also point out, too, that there are questions about the proof-of-stake world that don't exist in the proof-of-work world, right? Bitcoin is proof-of-work. You have a group of miners using ASICs. Anyone who wants to try to attack or hack the... Bitcoin world is going to have to go through years of computations and is going to have to have an army of ASICs that are task-specific to do so. Now, of course, that's not the way it is in the Ethereum world, right? If you start requiring validators to have 32 Ethereum each, right? If, in fact, your proof-of-stake work is being governed by validators who themselves are major holders of Ethereum, that could have a problem dealing with decentralization, right? It seems to me that proof of stake inherently is set up towards centralization, not decentralization, right? Also, there is a certain trust level that you have to have let me tell you a story that happened to me personally. 
I have some Binance coin, and I believe that's an outstanding investment, even though it's centralized. As I said, I'm a speculator, right? Understand the Binance Smart Chain. In the second quarter of this year, was the most used blockchain in the world, right? As I see it, a way to own part of the Binance ecosystem, and I know there's some regulatory scrutiny they're under right now, is to own BNB coin, right? Which is one of the top five market cap coins in all of the metaverse. But understand, I decided to stake uh, 10 of those coins on the trust wallet, right? Now they tell you, and I encourage people to do the research, go to the trust wallet, open it up, read the fine print. They tell you that if your validator loses validation, and understand validators can be punished for not doing a good job, then you might not get your staking rewards. Think about that. Understand, proof of work people have never heard of anything that silly. Because in the Bitcoin world, the miners are out for themselves. Right? You're not relying on the miners to give you staking rewards like you are validators in a proof of stake world. So I had my Binance coin, uh, which I delegated to a validator. Uh, you get to hold on to the coins. The validator can't run off with your coins. You always own them, right? But the validation allows them to use the coins in such a way that they're supposed to be staking rewards that you get. They're supposed to get compensated. You're supposed to get compensated. Well, after the period of time where I was supposed to get compensated came and went without me getting compensated, I noticed that a lot of people were redelegating away from my validator, right? Apparently my validator wasn't doing a good job. So it was up to me to hustle, to get away from this validator, to redelegate with another validator. I want people to understand that that's the risk in the proof of stake work world, excuse me, if you're with the wrong coin or you're in the wrong situation. Right now, I have several proof-of-stake coins, right? I'm speculating on getting the high-staking rewards some of them offer. But as I see it, and I know there's the environmentalist crowd out there that wants you to believe that using natural resources to help people become financially independent is somehow a misuse of natural resources, right? They're upset with Bitcoin because guess what? The ASICs do run on electricity, right? Well, I would argue that there's no more valuable reason to use natural resources other than creating food and water than to provide people with financial self-sovereignty. Well, just to understand the Bitcoin ecosystem is inherently decentralized, right? The miners want to make a profit. They're competing against each other. In the Ethereum space, Right, Ethereum 2.0 that's coming. You're going to have to trust validators. In a metaverse that really prided itself on being trustless, now you're going to have to start trusting people. It's even worse than that. We're supposed to believe that the fees are going to drop, right? Uh, that somehow this proof of stake, in addition to being more environmentally sound, is going to, you know, allow you to drop fees. Well, you know that saying, 
you get what you pay for. Would it surprise you to know that EIP 1559 allows for tipping? In other words, I'm doing a transaction on the Ethereum 2.0 network, and I can say, you know what? I want to offer a tip because I want to make sure that this transaction gets prioritized. I need this done quickly. I need this done right. Don't you think the idea that you can offer a tip is going to lead us back to where we were with exorbitant fees? Aren't people going to start offering larger and larger tips just to jump the line? Well, let me just say, the Lynn Alden piece is riveting. I hope people give it a look. I hope people understand the risk involved. I'm not trying to dissuade anyone from being involved with proof-of-stake coins. Just understand they're not as secure as Bitcoin. They're not as hard to hack as Bitcoin. Your relationship with the people who process the transactions will have changed materially. And of course, proof of stake, because I have to own a certain amount of Ethereum to be a validator, right? Proof of stake, in my opinion, is more inherently centralized than the decentralized proof of work. Let me also say too, we could all go around pretending that our coin is decentralized. The Bitcoin people know their coin's decentralized, right? The Ethereum people, if I'm a nefarious actor, why don't I just find a way to take down Amazon Web Services? That'll knock down 70% of the Ethereum nodes, right? Understand too, I don't have to be some illegal nefarious actor do so. I can just be the paragon of legality in this current world, the government itself, right? I'm not saying that they're moral. I'm just saying that they define what's legal. I could be the government and I can say, whoa, wait a moment. Ethereum's doing too much. We have concerns. I want to get votes from or dollars from some legacy finance constituency, right? So I'm going to launch an investigation of Ethereum. Guess what? Given the concentration of nodes using Amazon's web services, I actually have a hammer I can drop that'll greatly disrupt the Ethereum network. Folks, you simply don't have that with Bitcoin. The link to the Lynn Alden piece is in the description section of this video. I encourage those of you who want to learn more to give it a look. Let's talk about the framework a little bit more. It's important. Now, Michael Saylor likes to break up the metaverse into four categories, right? One is digital property. Think Bitcoin, right? It's like having gold coins in your pocket. You understand only 21 million Bitcoin will ever be minted. Unlike Ethereum, there's no question about the quantity, right? You knew the first day that Bitcoin was only gonna have 21 million ever minted. Right? This didn't change over time. It's not like halfway through you suddenly heard, hey, we're going to go to proof of stake. Then you suddenly heard, hey, we've decided to be somewhat deflationary for now. Right? No, no, no. With Bitcoin, you knew the deal. The first day you had it. They're only going to be 21 million minted period. There are no addendums, right? Only 21 million. So you have it in your pocket and you understand 
there is inherent scarcity here. I don't have to worry about politics. I don't have to worry about directional right turns. They're only going to be 21 million. If this digital property appreciates in value, your coins are going to be worth even more. Because if you have one Bitcoin, you have one 21 millionth of the total supply that'll ever be created. Right? So Bitcoin really is a coin that stands alone. Right? It's digital property. Then, of course, you have a means of exchange. Right? You don't want to bring gold coins to the marketplace because the gold coins are just worth too much. Right? The gold coins are your long-term investment. So you're going to use silver if you're using a means of exchange that's not a joke like Dogecoin. If you're using a limited supply means of exchange, you're going to use something that you can actually quickly use with vendors. Right? I take out a silver coin. Silver is undervalued. Let's say that silver coin costs, oh, 23 to $27, depending on what's happening at the moment. The cashier can give me change. I can make the transaction quickly. Right? Coins that operate with a certain level of quickness can be used as a means of exchange. Right? You want to separate out those coins from digital property. Then, of course, you have the digital platforms. I would consider Ethereum to be part of a digital platform. Right? A digital platform are railroad tracks, in essence. Right? They get you from here to there. If you're using an ERC-20 token, right? it runs on the Ethereum platform. But don't confuse platforms with digital property, with stores of value, because there are many platforms, and platforms change over time. Right? Today's train is going to be updated next year, then updated the year after. Others are going to step in. They're going to say, hey, we're also offering trains. There's going to be competition about new features. That's what's going to happen to Ethereum. Understand that's not going to happen with Bitcoin. How do you compete with digital gold? Right? If someone's holding gold, they already have inherent scarcity. Right? They don't want to hear about your newfangled invention. Gold's a finished product. They don't need to hear about additional bells and whistles. Then, of course, in addition to digital property, Bitcoin, means of exchange, right? A few coins, Dash and a few other coins, right? A digital platform, which is what Ethereum is, and, of course, Ethereum has competition as a digital platform, right? A lot of competition. Solana, Cardano, um, the Binance Smart Chain, right? Then you have apps. And you know what an app is. It's something like Uniswap, right? Apps are software that you know you're going to have greater and greater competition going forward, right? The apps themselves are going to evolve where they're going to have more features to better serve the consumer. Apps are very different than digital property. If I'm using Uniswap, and I'll concede, you know, there's a substantial network effect. There's a substantial first mover effect. But if I'm using Uniswap, it's to accomplish a specific goal. It's not to be a long-term store of value. Rather, it's to 
change one asset into another asset. Right? It's to make a swap. Well, understand, if I could get that from PancakeSwap, if I could get that from some other swap, well, I might do so if the fees are lower, if the experience is better. In other words, apps are always under pressure. Now, I'm not against owning any of these categories. But, as with any investment, investors need to understand the risk involved. They need to know the differences. Right? Bitcoin, which is digital property, is very different from Uniswap. I was out the other day and someone came up to me and wanted to know my thoughts on Dogecoin. I thought, you got to be kidding, right? Here I am valuing scarcity. Here I am looking for gold. Limited supply. Highly valued, right? In the case of Bitcoin, the hardest digital asset to hack. Here I am looking for gold and someone's talking to me about a digital fiat currency. You might as well be talking to me about a central bank issued digital currency. Right, folks, they're apples and oranges. Recognize the difference. Finally, let me close by saying Bitcoin maximalists these days have reached the point where they're talking about the Lightning Network as possibly allowing Bitcoin to jump the fence, to go from being a store of value to also being the consummate means of exchange. Understand the Lightning Network allows me to buy a cup of coffee quickly with a Bitcoin, right? The idea is that the network allows a lot of transactions to happen and then processes them as one transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. The Lightning Network is spreading like wildfire. People like Jack Mallers, who, in my opinion, makes the best argument for Bitcoin maximalism. I encourage you to look up his interviews. He's with Strike, an interesting app. Right, Jack Mallers is working right now with the government of El Salvador to spread the Lightning Network through that country, right? The idea is that if I can use Bitcoin, the hardest cryptocurrency to hack, as a means of exchange, right? With a high th throughput and quick time of transaction, why do I need any other means of exchange coins? Right? Now, just be aware that Bitcoin right now is threatening to take over the world. There is going to be consolidation in the space. But let me just tell you my libertarian view here. I like competition. I like the idea that coins like Dash, which is an excellent means of exchange, have privacy features that Bitcoin doesn't have, while, of course, having a limited supply, right? Dash, of course, years ago was a fork off of Bitcoin, right? So I don't want, for purely selfish reasons, I don't want even a dominant cryptocurrency like Bitcoin to take over the world to the exclusion of other forms of payment, right? I like some competition. It's comforting to me to know that even an Amazon faces competition from Walmart. Right? Let's keep Goliath innovative. Let's force Goliath to actually deal with a marketplace that's competitive. 
But just understand, the Lightning Network is a significant development in the world of cryptocurrency. Right? Just to understand that Bitcoin, the ultimate digital property, with the development of the Lightning Network, is threatening to obviate many means of exchange coins. Right? That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. The coins I'm looking at right now, um, I thought I would be loading up on Solana um, in the last few weeks, but Bitcoin dropped so much. Yesterday, it was below $30,000 a coin that I found myself buying Bitcoin, right? I do plan to get to these high throughput coins like Solana. I already own some Solana. Cardano, I believe they're going to take off. And of course, I love what Dash is doing. Right? I hope people give Dash a look. I understand Ashton Kutcher in a recent podcast mentioned Dash with his wife. Right, uh, Dash, by the way, is holding up nicely with this crypto upswing. Well, anyway, um, I do hope you give the Lynn Alden article a look. Understand, I'm not against speculating in Ethereum or other proof-of-stake coins. But you need to understand the risk involved, right? It's your money. You need to treat it well. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.